So thank you so much for joining us on a Tuesday night on uh, what has been already an exciting 2021. Um, I am Steph Pearson. I am with Learning Technologies and uh, we'll do a little bit more introductions in a short time, but I just wanna um, acknowledge that we are on Algonquin territory um, that is unseated. Um, again, for me, it's always about thinking about the ingenuity and the genius of the people who've lived here um, before the benefit of plastic and uh, machinery that they used the land to in ingenious ways to keep their families safe, their families, and to play and to work here. And I just think that's a, a real testament to the ingenuity of the first peoples here on this land. And if you'd like to pray with me, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. When this is over, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, Friday night out, the taste of communion, a routine checkup, the school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring, each deep breath, a boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, may we find that we become more like the people we wanted to be, we're called to be, we hope to be. And may we stay that much that way, better for each other, better for each other because of the worst. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Um, so again, I am Steph Pearson. I am a learning technologies consultant, but my other hat I wear is e-learning. So the last three years have been helping teachers to um, bring digital assessment in an asynchronous environment. So talking about how do we use the tools at our disposal to be able to talk about um, online assessment when we don't have access to what the kids are doing at home. So um, so that's the hat I'm going to be wearing today. I've kind of got a multi lens with that, but I have some fantastic humans today who have also jumped in and are um, have amazing pedagogical lenses. So I'm going to throw it over to Mary Lou. Hello, everybody. I see um, some familiar names in the chat, uh, some of the, the math folk out there. So I'm the 7 through 12 math consultant. I've taught e-learning uh, for two different, uh, two courses for the, the same course for two years, man, get that out. Um, and then I've been in this role for three years and learning with everybody else and trying to come up with some better practices to help us move forward and get to capture what students actually know. Josette. Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming in and joining us tonight. Um, my main portfolio is grade seven to 12 courses taught in French by teachers teaching in French, but I also do a lot with a literacy consultant. So happy to give any suggestions around those portfolios. And last but not least, Jennifer. Hi everyone, I'm Jen Goche. I'm new to the role, uh, seven to 12 science, nine to 12 business and nine to 12 phys ed consultant. So um, COVID is a great opportunity to jump in this role because a lot of things are new for a lot of people, but um, I'm enjoying things and eager to ch chat with all of you. Awesome. So we also know that their wisdom is in this room. So yes, we have these portfolios, but we know that there's genius sitting in the collective. So we're just wondering if you could pop your subject area into the chat box, you go to the chat box, and just, I'm gonna give you a couple minutes just to populate that with the subjects that you are teaching right now. And God forbid, we don't go back at the beginning of February, uh, maybe what you're going to be teaching or maybe you're teaching two subject areas now. But again, if you can find the chat box and just populate in there who you are, uh, well, we'll know who you are because <laughs> you're gonna have your name gonna pop up. Um, but uh, the, uh, whatever courses you are teaching. We got a lot of math in the house. All right, awesome sauce. Hey, that's awesome. So. Um, what we know is that some of the tools that work really beautifully in math can work really beautifully across the curriculum. And likewise, things that work really well in a history class or an English class can work in a math classroom. So, um, and that's really where we're going tonight is we want to uh, kind of just recognize if God forbid we don't go back next to next Monday that if the government decides, okay, we need to stay home for another week or two, how do we reframe what next week is gonna look like? Maybe in our head, we had an RST plan for our students that looked one way. So, and maybe you can't do it that way anymore because you're not gonna be face to face with your students. And that's okay because we're gonna, we're gonna figure it out. And one of the reasons why we have these fabulous people here is that we really want to um, 
we want to associate the fact that um, what they what we all can give here is is just ways strategies that you can um, think differently about your subject matter. Take what you've been doing all all quadmester, kind of roll it in a ball and pass it to your students so they can really demonstrate their learning. So there's a couple of things that we want you to keep in mind is we know that proctoring isn't possible, right? There is no real way that even sitting on your computer with your students with their cameras on, you don't really have an idea of what they're doing outside that frame. So it, it may seem like it worked, but I, I think it, it gives us a false sense of security. Um, students can still look up on their phones. Like I can be on my phone and looking at and still looking at the screen or maybe I'm looking at the screen, but I'm being distracted by my cat who's playing under the table. So just to keep that in mind, um, students may have other tabs open. They could have other tabs open on different browsers that even if you're using something like Hapra Highlights, it's not gonna capture um, what's going on on those other tabs. Um, Google Forms, we can't lock them. There is a lock mode and that's really hard to use if you aren't using a Chromebook. And if the students, again, have other tools, and it doesn't mean that they can't use their phones to be able to look up information. Um, we also know that students are gonna use spell check and grammar tools. Awesome, isn't that what we want them to use during the school year? So if they're leveraging those tools in their, um, in their language tasks, then um, one of the things that we can do is go, okay, great, they're using those tools. How does that, how can I validate the fact that they're using what's available to them in order to be more successful in learning? So all that to say, um, all that to say, when it comes to assessment next week, uh, and any time, really, what we really want to focus on is this idea of what counts, what matters, and what's important. And how does that all shape what a good final evaluation that might look like? And because our, our original plan for next week may not be fully possible, how can we tweak it so that it's more possible in case we don't go back next week? We're really trying to give you an opportunity to be more proactive um, and to think about it just so that it's not, if it, if it doesn't happen, great. If it does happen, then you have some more tools in your toolbox. So um, one of the things that uh, when I first started kind of thinking about a lot of this sort of things um, is this sort of question. How often do we just ask students to tell us what's important to them? Is there a place that in whatever final evaluation you're giving next week that you can say to the students, hey, I may have not have asked you specifically about this or this or this, tell me what you know about those topics. Because maybe those students talking about those topics all of a sudden shows you evidence of learning that you may not have seen in tasks beforehand. Um, when we give students opportunities to, to show what they know in unstructured ways, sometimes we get back more, sometimes we don't. But again, what's the harm in adding a question like that on an assignment where they can give you some more information that may not have been streamlined in the concepts that you've already talked about? And you can make this really focused as well. So maybe the rest of your RST focuses on six expectations. You can toss the other six on there and the kids can pick and choose and maybe say things that they know or maybe pull information. And again, you as the professional can look at that at the end and say, OK, they're just regurgitating stuff from the Internet. Okay, they didn't really show me that much more, but maybe it's stuff that you never considered. So again, it's framing. Um, I remember on a, in deep learning, uh, one of the speakers, I, it escapes me now who it was, but she basically said, every piece of evidence is evidence. There's nothing anecdotal. When we say, oh, anecdotal evidence says X and Y, Z, in learning, if we're observing, that's information about where the student is at. So just something to keep in mind. What does this tell you about the students, um, the students, understanding of a topic or what where where they could go in 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 direction of that so of course when we talk about what matters what counts what's important just go back to the overalls what do they actually say and are we are we focusing too much on the specifics and how can that liberate us to go, take that wider lens to look at those overalls excuse me because if we can assess those overalls everything else is icing. So if they can show us 10 pieces of expectations from those specific expectations, but they all go to the same overall, that's telling us one piece of information. But if they can give us bits and pieces of those specifics that goes to multiple overalls, well, then we get a better decision about whether those students are being successful in the course. Um, so I'm, I'm sure I, she didn't know I was going to throw her over to this, but Josette really kind of articulated this really beautifully. And I'm wondering if she would, uh, would like to speak to that. 
Sure. So um, basically the idea was as you're looking at your overall expectations, as you're really thinking about what do I need to include in my final assessment and evaluation of the course, take a look back at what you've done over the term. What are the things where you really covered those overall expectations quite well? Where are the gaps in your data? And then how can you take a look at what the students have already been doing? What tools you've been using? What ways that you've been having them demonstrate knowledge? How can you take those things that you're doing and leverage that to build your final evaluation? So it's not new for you. It's not new for them. It fills in those gaps and it's someone that every, something that everyone feels comfortable tackling. Beautiful. Thanks, Josette. So again, all of, just again, this is the reiteration, the reiteration of that idea. What have you done? What are you, you know the students can do? What tasks do they already do well? Can you leverage those tasks they already do well, change the content, and then you have your RST. Don't reinvent the wheel. You don't have time, they don't have time. What can you do to, to make that possible? And, and even going further, maybe this is not useful for you next week because we go back and your original plan works, no problem. Can it take you different directions in quadmaster three? So just again, what is the best for the students and where, and if you are feeling drained, we know that our students are feeling drained. So how can we, how can we get what we need without making everybody feel like they're going, they're having to do more because it's okay to be where you are. Um, and again, this is that frame. So remember, uh, so this is that whole idea of kids will Google everything. We know that. But how often do we Google things? We Google things all the time. How many times have you been having an argument when you're, you know, when we could go out to dinner with friends and we would have a conversation about something that we were arguing about and one of us would go to the Google and prove that we were right? Our students go to the Google just like us. So let's, let's let, it, let them Google things, but have them tell us why it matters. How does it relate to the learning that we're doing? How does it relate to a specific example that you're trying to get them to connect so it's not what can you remember, it's why. Why does it about, why does it matter? So how can you do this? Well, how do we embrace the fact that we know they're probably gonna look it up? So if we set an instruction that allows them to look it up, yes, it might take them longer to do that. Where are you going? We're not going anywhere. So is it okay to let them have a little bit more time? That's fine. Um, they're going to have their notes, they're going to have workspaces there. And even if they don't have access to the workspaces, they may have Google Docs where they've made no notes, maybe they've had paper notes, right? So again, just say, hey, use your notes if you need to. Um, you may, you may already give them maybe earlier this week, or later this week, you give them a replica of exactly what their final task is going to look like, but it's going to have different content. So maybe it's a much smaller version, because it's around the content of the unit instruction from this week. And then next week in their RST, they're taking a bigger lens, okay? Um, maybe give them choices of activities or tasks, right? A choice board is a really beautiful thing because they can choose and the way you structure it can hit a bunch of expectations. And even in that case, if you know you have a student who's been constantly struggling with a concept, you can say, hey, why don't you do this choice, this task, because I really need to know that you can do that. Whereas maybe other students may have more uh, greater breadth of being able to choose. And this one blew my mind because I was always giving site passages. And then somebody's like, well, I just give it to them ahead of time because then the kids who need the extra time to read it can have that time. The kids who need to use tools to be able or need to read it with their ears, they can have that. Students who need to read it several times for understanding can also do that. And the students who are going to just ignore it and not read it till the next day, they're still going to ignore it and read it till the next day. So how can we help our students and reduce their anxiety these are all ways we can do that. Again, once we decide, okay, we don't need to control everything, what can we give students so that everybody's more relaxed? And again, this is that whole idea of how do we, when we are creating tasks, and especially tasks in a remote environment, the tools that the concepts we need for our ESL learners, our students with an IEP, things that we can create that benefit them are good for everybody. So increasing the number of images, diagrams, um, drawing from uh, audio or visual cues, right? You're not sitting in a classroom this time with 30 other kids writing a test. Why can't you give them a video that has them look at what the concepts are? They're sitting at home by themselves or with their brothers and sisters or their family members, but why can't you give them a video to 
to engage with or a podcast. Again, as we mentioned, choice. Really make sure that students have uh, their different interests. Give them increased opportunity to prepare. The more you can give them this week, the more they're going to be prepared next week. And all those tools help other students who are typically going to soar, they're going to even soar higher because then they're not panicking about forgetting things. They can see all the things that they need and be able to engage in a more deeper way. So again, this is sort of some suggestions. You may have your students build some vocabulary lists using read and write, and then they can draw on those vocabulary lists to, to do the assignment. Or maybe you build them a vocabulary list and give it, well, you don't need to use this, but here's an opportunity. Um, or give even a word bank, right? I want you to use five of the words in this word box while you give your answer. And then you're having to show whether they can put those concepts together. Similarly, images. So uh, what kind of images, graphs, short readings can you put in either, a, you know, in a Google Doc or in a form that may tr trigger more ideas, especially in a student uh, when they're in a heightened sense of, uh, of, of stress, what can you help them to give them some guidance as to what they need to do? And again, this is another example, uh, video, and then have them identify themes from the concept. Again, you're not gonna be able to Google, give me chemistry ideas in French, or give me, give me chemistry ideas from baking bread. They're gonna have to pull some of those concepts out, or even if they do Google it and still find it, they're still gonna have to apply their chemistry knowledge to those concepts. Um, one of the tools that we, we need to, we want to make sure that we're just reminding people of, because we're seeing some problems of it. Um, when you're using that third column in workspace, we really need you to pull from the drive icon. So you're not using the share, the, the link icon, and you're not using the upload icon. You're using that drive icon in the workspace, because that's going to make sure that that communication between drive, your Google docs and workspace is completed appropriately. So if you're having any trouble in that department. Um, that's a that's our big. I'm going to jump in for one second. There is one um, one restriction to that Google Forms. Um, if you're putting a form in the third column, don't do it that way because you upload your actual form into the third column and they see the questions and have editing privileges and all those different things. So, uh, other than the form, uh, make sure you use the drive icon. But the form you need to generate the share link from the form and put that in the link section because I'm speaking from personal experience. I was gonna say, I feel like you've had an experience, but yeah, that's excellent, excellent idea. So um, when we were having this conversation about what this was gonna look like, we, Mary Lou was like, no, no, we need to talk about the tools and how people can leverage them for next week. So we put together uh, uh, a few slides to basically talk about the pros and cons of some of the big tools that we're using, maybe things that you hadn't considered uh, with these tools. So we're talking about which ones are the most accessible to the ones that you're gonna have some more drama with. This is kind of the order. Uh, Google Docs are your friends, period, full stop. They are the best in terms of students with for an IP. If a student needs assistive technology, Google Doc is gonna serve all their needs. Why? Because it uses the whole read and write toolbar. You can add drawings as annotations. You can add images and links to support the students learning. Again, you can add a Screencastify link so that the students can listen to you instruct what they're supposed to do. It's easily shareable by the third column. You can use tables to organize answers. You can have a full revision history, and it also has that spelling and grammar check. It doesn't have any uh, in video embedding, but you can always put the link. Also, um, to I'm gonna jump in here too, because I didn't get a chance to add it to the list. From a science and math perspective, kids being able to show their math digitally or being able to upload their math through the mobile feature, um, very user friendly for students as long as they know how to use it. So whether I, Google Docs is, is super useful for all those um, ways to present work to students and get evidence of their thinking too. The, big, the biggest issue with the Docs is being able to annotate directly on there, um, but there are some workarounds. Yeah, absolutely. And again, with an RST, you're not having to give the, the distinctive full feedback that you would necessarily on a document that is going to be built on in the future. So um, depending on what your what your needs are for that assessment purposes, 100%. So uh, definitely that annotation piece is missing there for sure. Um, did I ask one of you ladies to talk to docs or is it the next slide? You asked me to talk to docs. So just to Perfect. add on stuff, if you're doing any sort of language courses, but also pulling in, we know in Growing Success, they ask us to bring in that conversation. So anytime that you want to add um, really that oral side of things, 
a great idea is you can have your your sort of launch text or your launch your base text in your google doc but then have them add on they can add on voice notes you can have students actually if you create a table put one student's name they put their little voice note comment reflection another student can put their name in and tag a voice note and they can have a conversation back and forth that way in terms of the read and write if you're looking at really them getting into what's important what matters in a document how are they pulling information out of a document rather than just going back to that content recall that they can search up again like steph mentioned you can have them highlight you can have them drop in voice notes you can have them drop in comments so they're really giving you a rich clear picture of how they understand how to pull information out of a document how they understand the content and how they're able to communicate about that content all through one really simple tool. All right, Google Slides is also amazing. So this becomes really amazing uh, because you can add images. So we know that in chemistry, you're writing complete, you know, complicated um, balancing equations, right? So students may need to do that on paper. Well, you can add an image directly from Google Drive, from your phone, right? So you, you can upload it directly into a slide deck. You can do that in a, in a doc as well, but certainly make them they're much easier to manipulate on a slide. Um, you can use mind maps or collages on a slide. Um, again, works beautifully in workspace. So you can put your instructions on each different slide. You can have text boxes for answers. You have a revision and you can also add an audio clip. So again, for, um, for language instruction, you can add an audio clip spoken by the teacher and you can have your listening skills that way. Um, read and write is not so easy to use with with slides, but there are hacks that students can use once they they get better at that. Um, digital portfolios was that you, Jen? Yep. Um, just wanted to put a sample there for people. A great RST idea if you've been working on getting students to collect evidence throughout the term. Um, you could ask them to complete a digital portfolio again using the camera in the slides feature to just upload pictures of their work into the Google Slides. Um, you just have to click on, uh, oh. if you let me present Steph, I can get that link live, sorry. Okay, so this is just an example of a digital portfolio instructions there for students. And then you can go through different goals and cater to what you wanted um, for students to demonstrate. You could ask them to do a mind map of their learning throughout the course. Things like um, collaboration and group work, anything that they have done project-based, um, individual work that they want to port show in their portfolio, and then connections to uh, society, technology, and the environment. So. Um, a, an essential question or an overall expectation could go in there and they could demonstrate learning with video, with audio, with images, other resources. And then just useful links for studying. They could show you where they went and how they figured stuff out and final thoughts. So um, another great tool in Google Slides. Again, I mentioned the camera function for uploading mind maps. It can be really simple, done on paper. Uh, they highlight concepts that they totally know um, maybe green highlighter for things they still have questions on and pink, I've got this. So you can get them to, to give you a gauge of their learning right there. And I'll throw it back to you, Steph. Awesome. And again, this is uh, another lab report. Again, um, giving some, do you want to speak to this too, Jen? Sorry, I forgot about that slide. Um, yeah, it's really simple. If you don't want to use a tool like Book Creator or um, other digital tools, you just know Google Slides, and that's what the students have been using the whole um, semester or quadmester, I guess, or octomester. Then um, you could get them to insert a series of pictures, add their captions for what's happening in the images. Even if you want to screenshot from YouTube videos, recordings of labs, because we're not in school right now and we can't necessarily conduct labs they can find screenshots and describe what's happening in um, each of those screenshots. So it's really good. And there's some numbers you can't see on the left in red, um, but that's just the steps of the lab. So image one, two, three, four in sequence. Thank you. Um, Google Forms, uh, these become a really quick way to, actually, Mary Lou, do you wanna to speak to this? Because I know you use a lot of forms. Uh, yeah, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but in terms of getting quick multiple choice, quick answer questions where you can have it self-grade, which in, in any situation is, is nice to have, 
it generate a mark right away and whether or not you can control what kids see in terms of their grade or which questions they got right, wrong, all those different things. So it, it's great for those types of things. Um, the longer questions of showing your work or different things like that, you can still collect it through the form. Uh, however, the marking side of it is a little bit more challenging in terms of long answer questions. You can still see their responses. However, being able to provide the feedback, it requires a little bit more work. So in my personal opinion is that forms are useful for that. If you think of a traditional assessment where you have that little knowledge piece at the beginning where it was quick one pointers on whether or not they got it. Um, and really having it available for a certain amount of time could help mitigate in terms of, of how, how long they would have to look up the answer if that is a concern. Um, but it's a quick way, 10 questions, get a quick idea of, of um, the simple knowledge stuff. Absolutely. Um, and you can use Equatio in there as well. So the students have that practice. They, it works really beautifully in uh, both for you as the creator of the Google Doc as well as the students to answer those questions. Um, you can also stop responses. So if you have a finite amount of time that you want the students, as Mary Lou said, there's a video there about how to actually kind of close the, the, so they can still see that there's a quiz there, but they can't actually answer it. So uh, that's one way to use it. Um, so those are all possibilities. And again, there's, it gives you that option. You can add a video and then add questions that are associated to that video all within the Google form. Again, that the self-marking piece is something that you're going to want to practice. Again, maybe not something you want to try for next week, um, but certainly something you can put in your toolkit for sure. Um, Jamboard, everybody's discovered Jamboard has some really, really cool features, but it has some hiccups. Um, excuse me, we can add images, you can draw right on the tool. So that becomes really brilliant for annotation purposes. You can provide a customized background. Again, the background isn't read read readable by read and write. You can sometimes, depending on how clear words might be in it, you can use a screenshot reader. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, you can share it with the third column, although HAPRA is working on the fact that when you submit it, it doesn't work properly. Um, so you would have to go into each individual jam that you shared with the student and remove their editing access from it. So that's going to the share tab and then removing the student as an editor. If that was concerned to you that you didn't want them to be able to go back in and edit it. Um, you can create a document or a jam that has up to 20 slides so that you had several questions on each jam or, or activities or whatever knowledge you were trying to guide the students through. Um, and again, that can go out through the third column. The students have their own individual copies and then they can use all the different tools available to them um, to interact with that. Um, so it's not an easy, there are some like sharing issues around JAM. So if that's not a concern to you, then it's a beautiful tool, especially for something like math and science for sure. Um, PDFs. Just don't. <laughs> PDFs, they're, they, they're a nightmare. And if you spend more time trying to make a PDF work, then is that the best energy that you are spending? So um, just avoid a PDF. And again, those are conversations we would love to have with you as an alternative. How do we take something that we really love in PDF form and how do we make it more accessible? How do we make it interactive? How do we make it so that students can engage with it? Back to you, Mary Lou. Well, and the, all of these people in here who, who know me know that I'm a, um, a, a huge advocate for using Equatio and Equatio Math Space even more so now um, that it keeps getting more and more user friendly. Uh, just, just this week, now students can actually save their work instead of having to um, submit it to ensure that it gets saved. So that's an update. And I, um, I, I just think it's a a good way for teachers to be able to get student thinking as long as they know how to use it. Like any tool that's out there, if you don't invest the time in teaching them how to use it efficiently and appropriately, and when when to use the handwriting tool if they have a touch screen versus trying to make their math digital or to do their work on a piece of paper. Like I think of some of the questions that students have in advanced functions that take a lot of um, writing to do, and it would be easier just to upload an image than to um, write it out. But again, it's something that the students would need to be familiar with before you throw it at them. Don't just be like, here, do this, and it's gonna be 20% of your mark. Um, just make sure that you show them how to do it. You can generate your links and put them in Hapara. I'm working with students across the city in grade eight, and I share the link straight in the third column. They click on it. 
The downside of it is you can't close it like you can with lots of other things. There is a timestamp. So if you say that it has to be done by 3 p.m. Um, and they submitted it at nine o'clock at night, then obviously that's a conversation that you could have with the student to figure out what's going on. So you can't completely, um, they can keep resubmitting it until you go in and give them feedback. So, um, however, it is a great way to be able to get the student thinking. It has Desmos built right in there for the science teachers out there. It has a para table built in there, a molecular viewer that's kind of new now. Um, there's a scientific calculator that's built in there now on top of the graphing calculator. So it, um, I find it, the more I use it, the more um, options that I see with it. They also have a rapid feedback reviewer now where it pops up on the side, kind of like it does in Hapara where each kid is there and then you scroll through each kid and you can type feedback. Um, you can give a grade if you choose. I've never put a grade in there, but I give the feedback, you send it back to the kids and then they can either make adjustments or uh, it is what it is. If you're concerned about someone changing something or anything like that, you have the option to be able to save all of the pages as an image. So you can um, archive anything if you're worried about it. Uh, at this point in time, you have to do it page by page. However, uh, I've been told that coming soon, you should be able to download the whole space as um, an, a collection of images. Uh, but at this point in time, it's not like that. So I, I think that, um, from a math science perspective, it's probably one of the best tools out there for workflow on both sides. But then again, I've been using it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about practice. And I think you said something that was really, uh, really amazing, right? When we think about um, our traditional exams, when we think about traditional um, sitting down for a two or three hour exam, and it would be 20% of a mark. Uh, and then we would have a student do RSTs for 10% and that would be four days worth of work, right? So um, think about how we, um, how we distribute those times. Does that really make sense that four days worth of work is worth 10% and a two hour exam is worth 20? So again, what are, what's the expectation that we have in our, with, from our students? And can we turn it down a notch by um, making it more accessible that maybe we're hitting uh, expectations differently so that we know uh, what the students are capable of without being overwhelming uh, to them uh, to in, in their performance and to you uh, assessing it uh, because there's obviously a quick turnaround with all of this as well. Back to you Mary Lou. Yeah so um, in in this world of the internet and math often being one of the courses where you want everyone to have the same answer because <laughs> you gave them the question and there is an answer or there might be more than one answer if it's depending on the uh, degree of the function that we're talking about. Um, but the tools are out there. So this is a, a screenshot of my phone. These are all the different math apps that I have right now installed on my phone where I can just take a picture of my work and it will tell me an answer. So lots of different ones out there, various degrees of um, some I like better than others. Um, the, the one that I've just been learning about most recently is Chegg, uh, where students can actually pay a fee and while they're doing their tests can actually upload an image of the question on the test that was just given to them. And within a half hour, I think is the max time that is stated that it will take for an answer to come back to them. So um, it's out there and we really need to figure out how we can use that to our advantage or really flip how we're asking kids these questions. So here, instead of asking, here's this quadratic function, tell me what the roots are. I strongly believe in giving them the answer and really making them explain why. The why questions, the explaining the why, the, the AI is not there quite yet. I'm sure it will be in the next year or two probably, um, but it's not there quite yet. But really asking the why um, and even asking them, is it right or is it wrong? If they go and take an image of whatever solution you give them and then put it into the photo math, it will show them a new solution they'll be able to tell if the answer that you came to is the same as the answer that they came to. However, it doesn't explain why. So 
really, as Steph had mentioned before, looking at the expectations that you you might be light on that you haven't really covered, or there's a key part of your course that you know students struggle with, and this RST is the last kick at the can to let them show you that they finally get it. Um, maybe those are the questions that you really focus on in terms of your RST and including, you don't need hours and hours and hours of questions um, asking the same thing that you already have evidence for. So it's, um, I, I really think going down this road will make your life a little bit easier because you can cut back on how many questions you have to give them and really target those areas that I know the people who are on this call for the most part, you're experienced teachers and you know those um, problem areas that kids have where we really want to get it out of them whether or not they actually know it. Just to build on what you just said, Mary Lou, I think that's true across so many subject areas that there's so many spots now where we can Google what's the scientific formula or the scientific answer for something. What is the popular literature analysis on a specific document that's studied over and over in school? But if you really dig into the why is this important? Why is this knowledge useful? How can you connect it to something else you know? How did it expand your thinking? That's where you really get into the key. And again, link back to, like Steph said at the beginning, link back to those overall expectations. The overall expectation is not to understand how to get to a specific answer. It's to understand the why behind the process, the why behind the digging into something. And that's where we want to go with these. And that's the stuff that you can't Google. I'm just going to th say one more little tiny thing about this whole Chegg thing. And uh, so I've been going down all kinds of rabbit holes with finding answers on the internet. And what I found this thread that a university professor who has kind of shifted his thinking in terms of the assessment piece. And he had, he made a note about uh, exam banks. And he suggested if you do use an exam bank, which I do know science and teachers definitely make use of those tools that have been purchased for them. Um, if you use it verbatim from the test bank, chances are that verbatim the answer's out there. So they can put it in word for word and find the solution um, to that question. So something to keep in the back of your head if you are using test banks um, to generate questions for different things that uh, where you can't control how this or what information the students have access to. Come on and speak to this for everyone. So just a quick example in science of something that, you know, could be a knowledge based question drawn label the water cycle, we can make this a really application style question where they have to relate um, their knowledge of society, the environment, um, by asking them to find an article or an infographic that illustrates the importance of the water cycle, how it relates to climate change, and then go further and say why it's a good example. Um, so really having to pull um, some good samples from the internet to explain their thinking. Awesome, thanks Jen. Um, and again, this idea of choice. So instead of having them read one text, maybe you're providing multiple texts that they can choose something that works for them. Um, maybe it's a podcast that they're listening. So it's a, it's a listening, but there's a transcript. So they're having that, that double combination, because if you look at the way the language is written and Joseph, Joseph can speak to more of this, it's not necessarily, can you make out the words? It's what do the words mean? What's the, what's the theme there? Does that, do you know how to speak to that a little bit more? Well, but it's also really looking into how do I connect it to other things that I've been learning this term, um, what are the things in the article that help me to understand what's the prior knowledge? What are the skills that I've developed this term to be able to break this down? And just to add to, uh, Steph mentioned New Zella for English. There's also um, L'Actualité, Radio Canada, and lots of other ones available through the OCSB FSL page for French teachers as well. But really that idea of let's, Let's let them choose the article that they feel will be the most effective to demonstrate what they've developed in terms of reading comprehension skills over this semester. Jeff, you're still on mute. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just gonna pop over to this choice board. Again, an example of what this might look like. Um, so taking uh, an essential question from your course um, and relating it to current events, videos, TED Talks, listen to a podcast. And so then they would then take that information 
and do something with it. So again, this is a, I would assume something like slide carnivals or something like that, um, where it's a beautiful template, but it walks you through exactly what you need to. And as the student is working through that, those concepts, and again, this is something you could do in science, you could do it in English, you could do it in contemporary studies, you could do it in religion. There's the sky's the limit because it's, again, what are they doing with it and how are they connecting it to what they've learned as opposed to regurgitate this information. So um, a really great little um, opportunity there for learning. Do to do, of course, my internet's slowing down now too. Um, so again, same sort of thing, instead of written texts, thinking about podcasts, again, really, really essential for uh, modern languages. Um, and then again, how does that relate to the, the concepts of the course that they've been talking about? Um, uh, so. Uh, similarly, in contemporary studies, you might want to use um, uh, creating evaluation that mirror the jobs that they're going to be doing. So in, in terms of um, history, doing a mock trial, um, a role play, constitutional concepts, in politics, mock parliament, UN, uh, position paper, write a letter to an MP, doing these sort of things in law. And there are really great ways. So now we have breakout rooms. We can use Screencastify to have the kids, um, if they're going to have a debate or a conversation in a breakout room, you can have them record their conversation in that breakout room um, and then send that link to you or have it in the chat and then they record the chat and send that to you as well. So again, even though we aren't all in the same room, um, there are ways that we can have those interactions. Um, similarly, uh, with science and something like geography, um, you know, giving them an infographic and have them talk about why it matters. Um, and, and again, those big ideas, what if, if a kid never takes another science course, what is the most important thing you want them to know when they leave that science course or that geography course or that French course? What is the thing that you want them to go away and go, oh yeah, that really, that important thing was really important to me in that course. Um, one of the tricks that I was going to show you just before we uh, actually does anybody do any of you want to speak to any more of these examples before I show people how to revoke access on a workspace. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the, we get this question a lot in LT and essentially um, so I'm just going to walk through exactly how you would do it. So um, here's my exam or my RST. So I'm sorry, I'm using an exam. We aren't giving exams, but again, this is the example that I had ready on the ready. So on my workspace, I'll show you. So it's in that third column. So there it is in the third column. And I can see I have three students that have submitted it. So, um, so I can do a couple different things. So I can go in here to the student's work because when, again, when you have given it in that third column, it means that you are the owner and the student is not. So actually, so right now the student has edit access or sorry, they have comment access. So if I wanna make sure that student never opens that, doesn't have access to it, I need to revoke access. So I can go, I'm trying to take a shortcut here and I'm not sure it's gonna work. So up here in my share file, I can go in here, do, 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 do waiting patiently. There we go. Okay, I can see there is student 13 as a commenter, and I can remove them from having access to it. So then even they don't, so they can't find it in their drive. It doesn't exist in their drive anymore. So again, if you have an assignment that you don't want the students to be able to get anymore, that's one way to do it. The other option is to go into drive, search the student's name, and you can revo revoke the access that way as well. Um, but you can you can follow this sort of workflow. So again, I can do the same sort of thing, go into student 17, remove their uh, ability to see it, and then they, they won't have access in Drive. So um, it's just using that, leveraging that share button, taking the student out and, and going from there. Does that make sense? There is a video somewhere, I think I linked it to it in the, in the, uh, the, the slide deck. I can't, it's so close to my bedtime. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but again, that's another way that you can think about um, how, what you want the students to be able to access uh, long-term versus what you may want to protect. Um, that is something that you have used again in the past. Um, 